I'm very, really pleased to be here and to see this very large um, uh, group of uh, attendees that we have. And um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting and stimulating uh, week. I think that um, maybe it was implied, but uh, uh, Dr. Thornton, I'm, I'm sure, meant to say that uh, in the course of the week, uh, at the, during mealtime or during social hour or at other times, uh, feel free to go up to any of the uh, uh, instructors for our, uh, our week-long seminar and any of the questions you have, problems you have, things that uh, you'd like to discuss, uh, that's, that would be a time to bring them up. <coughs> now, I'm going to be talking about Ludwig von Mises, his uh, life to an extent, his, his work. I've been involved with uh, Mises' um, work ever since high school, when my buddy um, George Reisman, uh, who was, I think, 16 years old at the time, uh, maybe, I don't know, for all I know, 14, had, uh, had finished reading Human Action and was uh, very enthusiastic about it and uh, introduced me to this, uh, to this thinker. And to a, a smaller or larger degree, I've been involved with uh, Mises uh, and his thought ever since. Now, many years ago, when uh, William F. Buckley, Jr., was at the begin many years ago, the beginning of his um, uh, career of uh, uh, lecturing at colleges, and then he went on to other uh, groups. Um, and uh, in the days when he was somewhat more tolerant of libertarians than he is today, uh, he used to begin his talks by writing two names on the blackboard <laughs> in those days. Um, one was the uh, a defender of democratic socialism, I think it was uh, John Ken uh, Kenneth Galbraith, it could have been Lasky or John Dewey, uh, was uh, recognized by most of those present. He was trying to uh, sort of incarnate the great world historical debate between socialism and uh, the private enterprise system. So th that was the democratic socialist, and almost all the students had heard of, of I think it was probably Galbraith. Uh, so they raised their hand. And then Buckley would put on the blackboard the name of Ludwig von Mises, uh, who was entirely unknown to them. Needless to say, the situation has not basically improved uh, since then, ex except perhaps in the sense that uh, many college students now have heard of w William F. Buckley, Jr. <laughs> <laughs> now, how, is it, how has it been possible that the great majority of economics and social science students at fine colleges and universities are, are totally unfamiliar with Mises. At the time of his death in October 1973, even the New York Times, in its notice, in its obituary, termed Mises one of the foremost economists of this century, unquote. And Milton Friedman, you'll hear something during the week about uh, uh, the differences between <coughs> Milton Friedman and the uh, Austrian school, but even Milton Friedman, uh, from a totally different tradition of economics, called Mises, quote, one of the great economists of all time, unquote. I think typically uh, generous uh, tribute on, on the part of uh, Friedman. But actually, uh, Mises was even more than a great economist. Throughout the world, among knowledgeable people, in German-speaking Europe, in France, in Britain, in Latin America, in Japan, uh, in our own country, Mises was famous as the great 20th century champion uh, of a certain uh, school of thought, a uh, school of thought that could be said to have a certain historical importance and maybe even intellectual respectability. Uh, the school of thought that began with Adam Smith, David Hume, Turgot, included Wilhelm von Humboldt, Bentham, Benjamin Constant, Alexis de Tocqueville, Acton, Bern Bavark, William Graham Sumner, Herbert Spencer, Wilfredo Pareto, and many others. The tradition of classical liberalism. Mises was understood to be the great representative of classical liberalism in the mid-20th century. Offhand, one would have thought that this acknowledged position alone would have entitled Mises to being rep uh, presented uh, within the pluralistic setting 
of uh, left liberal American academia. And then there were Mises' Mises' scientific achievements, which were extraordinary. And uh, uh, most or maybe all of our instructors could uh, address those questions much better than, than I could, but let me just mention his pioneering work in uh, monetary theory and in the theory of the business cycle, his profound work in the methodology of economics and the a priori derivation of economic truths, his systemizing of all economic theory in his magnum opus, Human Action. Uh, but let's take another example. It is conceded on all sides that the whole discussion revolving around the viability of a system of central economic planning, in this discussion, Mises played the key role. Now, socialism in that sense is dead, it's, it's over with, but it shaped um, the larger part of the, of the 20th century. And um, uh, so, therefore, it's of great historical uh, importance. Now, quite possibly, the great intellectual scandal, still unadmitted, of the, of the uh, last century, has been that the vast international Marxian movement, including thousands upon thousands of professional thinkers in all fields, um, famous names, was for generations content to discuss the whole issue of capitalism versus socialism solely in terms of the alleged de defects of capitalism. Uh, capitalism is responsible for everything. I mean, it's just, just a beginning of the litany you can find in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, and it was responsible for contradictory things also. It was responsible for undermining the uh, family. It was responsible for, for pr promoting the bourgeois family. It was uh, uh, responsible for destroying religion on the, in, the, in the view of many conservatives. Uh, it was also responsible for, uh, for propping up rel religion. But whatever it was, capitalism was responsible. The question of how and how well a socialist economy would function was avoided as taboo. It was Mises' great accomplishment and a sign of his superb independence of mind. To have brushed aside this pious, one just doesn't speak of such things. And to have presented comprehensively and arrestingly the problems inherent in attempting rational economic calculation in a situation where no market exists for production goods. Anyone familiar with the structural problems with which uh, uh, all the more advanced communist countries are con continually faced will understand the significance of Mises' work in this one field alone. It was, in fact, um, the irra this irrationality inherent in the socialist system that finally brought communism down. It was not um, uh, having uh, forced them to spend more on defense because of the of the, of the um, Star Wars uh, system that the U.S. was undertaking. It was something that had been going on from the very beginning because of the, of the deep-seated, entrenched irrationality of their economic system. That became totally manifest, impossible to avoid, when the information revolution came around and people in the Soviet Union could see on television and uh, in uh, video uh, cassettes, uh, uh, in uh, all the new, on, on the internet for that matter, the difference between uh, the way of life of people in uh, the Soviet Union uh, or in the, in the uh, East um, uh, Zone uh, uh, satellite states and the people in the West. It just became t uh, uh, too much of a, of a burden of lies to maintain at that point. But the root uh, cause of this was their irrational economic system. There's a man named Robert Heilbrunner, who wrote an influential history, history of economic thought that was used in many undergraduate courses. And uh, he was a socialist, or a, a democratic socialist. And he ref, uh, refers in an article in The New Yorker uh, from 1990 to this debate on uh, the feasibility of socialist planning. He says, in the 1930s, when I was studying economics, a few economists had already expressed doubts about the feasibility of centrally planned socialism. One of them was Ludwig von Mises, an Austrian of extremely conservative views. Right, he's another uh, uh, 
uh, I don't know, Jesse Helms or uh, Jim Sessions or something, <laughs> who had written of the impossibility of socialism, arguing that no central planning board could ever gather the enormous amount of information needed to create a workable economic system. Well, that really wasn't the whole argument. The whole argument was basically uh, uh, based, uh, in terms of uh, property rights and the price system. Um, our skepticism was fortified when Oscar Lange, a brilliant young Polish economist, who became, who had uh, become the first post-war Polish ambassador to the U.S., in other words, a member of the Communist Party, wrote two dazzling articles showing that a board would not need all the information that Mises said it couldn't collect. All that such a board would have to do, Lange said in these dazzling dazzlingly brilliant articles, was to watch the levels of in inventories in its warehouses. If inventories rose, the obvious thing to do was to lower prices so that goods would move out. Well, uh, he, so he knows that much. Uh, and if inventories were too rapidly depleted to raise prices in order, in order to discourage sales. <laughs> that really sounds like the recipe for, for a dynamic, uh, entre entrepreneurial, innovative do uh, economy, doesn't it? You just watch the warehouse and, and, and look at the inventories for the goods that you have on hand and, and uh, follow this uh, rule. Fifty years ago, it was felt that Langa had decisively won the argument for socialist planning. Well, you can imagine what that means in terms of the state of, uh, of the profession in those days. Um, okay. And then, uh, and then uh, Brunner... Uh, uh, um, uh, Robert Heilbrunner says that it turns out, of course, that Mises was right. Oh, really? <laughs> um, this, the Soviet system has long been uh, dog, dogged by a, a method of pricing that produced grotesque um, uh, misallocations of efforts. Uh, and then he says they had some spectacular results. Um, the, da the dams and mills in entire new cities of the 1930s astonished the world, right? Uh, the, the fellow travelers who were taken on, a, on, a, on trips of Potemkin villages. Uh, but listen to this. As did the Chinese great leap forward of the 1950s, which performed similar miracles from a still lower base. The miracles consisted in uh, 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 hundreds or tens of millions of Chinese peasants trying to smelt um, steel uh, in their backyards, decentralization uh, of uh, production and uh, every um, uh, little communist mind uh, adding uh, to the process of production. And he thinks that the world was, was astonished by this great leap forward. I was around for this, for this great leap forward of the 1950s. Some of us were also. And it wasn't the world that was ast uh, astonished. It was communist fellow travelers who talked up the thing. Well, in any case... He says that uh, Mises was right. So what's the, uh, what's the result of that? Well, you just have to say, oops, sorry, we were wrong uh, about the feasibility of socialism. And, um, but, you know, these intellectual mistakes are taken out of the hides of the uh, people of Soviet Russia and then out of the hides of the people of Poland and uh, Hungary and, uh, and other countries so that... Um, when the uh, communist system was uh, was overturned, uh, there were huge demonstrations in the in the streets, uh, Russian cities, 75 years on the on the road to nowhere, 75 years of uh, deprivation, uh, because uh, the world's intellectuals thought that uh, the communist argument was um, was basically sound. So, uh, how do we account then for the fact? that those who lionized men like, and I don't know if you even know these names, but they were world-famous um, uh, uh, intellectuals, considered liberals, by the way, lionized men like Raymond Aron, a very banal Keynesian, uh, and Isaiah Berlin, pardon me, Sir Isaiah Berlin, a high-level popularizer of uh, ideas, who lionized them seriously as important social philosophers, somehow could never bring themselves to familiarize their students with Mises, or to familiarize themselves for that matter, or to show him the marks of public recognition and respect that were, were his due. 
He was, for instance, uh, never president of the American uh, Economic Association. His uh, salary at NYU was not even paid for by the university. They wouldn't even pay, I mean, all they did was uh, provide him with a uh, room for his uh, seminar at NYU. It was paid for by the Volcker Fund, um, a uh, libertarian-leaning uh, foundation in those days. Uh, however, Mises, Mises did produce a handful of uh, PhD students. Um, they include names like uh, Israel Kirzner, Hans Stenholz, and George Reisman. Uh, but uh, similarly uh, to Mises' situation, Hayek's salary at Chicago was, was paid for by outside sources. His uh, salary at the uh, uh, Committee on Social Thought, where he was my professor. Since uh, Hayek could not get a job in the economics department of Milton Friedman and George Stigler. He was not a real economist in their view. Um, that's exactly what, the, what they held against him. He didn't deal with uh, empirical data and uh, for, uh, falsifiable, empirically falsifiable theories. So part of the answer to the great neglect of Mises, I think, lies in what Jacques Rueff, famous uh, French economist uh, of his day, in a warm tribute called his intransigence. Mises was a complete doctrinaire, not a dogmatist, but a doctrinaire, a relentless and implacable fighter for his doctrine. For over 60 years, he was at war with the spirit of his age, uh, with every one of the advancing victorious, modish, um, collectivist uh, political schools left and right. The times that, uh, that uh, he lived in Central Europe, I try sometimes to imagine what it must have been like uh, for him. There was nobody who could remotely be called a liberal uh, east of the Rhine. There were some semi-liberals in France and Britain and in, even in America, but he was all alone. And he had to face um, uh, the socialists, who considered him some uh, bourgeois apologist, uh, some... Um, class enemy, uh, as well as the right wing and especially the Nazis, the rising Nazi movement, who attacked him as a Jew. And um, it, it never fazed him. I mean, uh, uh, George and I knew him when he was still, what, in his 70s or something, uh, very spry, very alert, uh, all his faculties about him. And he, didn't, he never displayed any trauma, right, any, any uh, psychological uh, wounds uh, from uh, what had been or would have to other people have been a very daunting uh, early uh, years experience. Decade after decade, Mises fought against militarism, protectionism, inflationism, every variety of socialism, every policy of the interventionist state, and through most of the time he stood alone or close to it. The totality and enduring intensity of Mises' battle could only be fueled from a profound inner sense of the truth and supreme value of the ideas that he was struggling for. This, as well as his temperament, one might say, one might admit, produced a definite uh, arrogance, maybe, in his tone, or apodictic uh, quality, as some of us uh, in the Mises Seminar in, at NYU called it, using one of his own favorite words, uh, that, um, that struck others as uh, very inappropriate. Such uh, arrogance and sense of superiority was the last thing academic left liberals and social democrats could accept uh, in the defender of a view they considered only marginally worthy of toleration to begin with. This would, I, uh, this would largely account, I think, for the somewhat greater recognition that has been accorded to, to Friedrich Hayek, even before Hayek uh, received his greatly deserved Nobel Prize. Hayek was temperamentally much more moderate in expression than Mises ever was. Uh, Hayek preferred, for instance, to avoid the, the old slogan of laissez-faire. Hayek has said in uh, many times, and people keep, you know, if you look, look up critiques of Hayek, they keep saying he was a defender of laissez-faire capitalism and so on. Uh, time and time again, he uh, rejected uh, laissez-faire. Um, he said uh, there's no need to go back to that. Um, old extreme point of view. Um, and it is hard to imagine Mises making such a gesture as Hayek did 
in dedicating the road to serfdom to socialists of all parties. Uh, it would be like Ayn Rand dedicating an Atlas to thugs of every description. <laughs> but the lack of recognition had deflected Mises not in the least. Instead, he continued his work decade after decade, accumulating contributions to economic uh, theory, developing the theoretical structure of the Austrian school, and from, from his understanding of the laws of economic activity, elaborating, correcting, and bringing up to date the great social philosophy of classical liberalism. I want to mention something that um, is sometimes forgotten about Mises. He was all his life an ardent student of history. And, it, uh, and people think that because um, he based his economics on an a priori methodology, uh, he had no interest in, or little interest in uh, history, or that the history was irrelevant. Nothing could be further from the truth. He knew, more, he knew more history than the whole Chicago school put together. Um, but history was not the, the uh, way to establish the, act, the uh, principles, the theories of economic science. But history was very valuable in, in uh, other ways. And it was his understanding of economic principles that enabled him to penetrate to the heart of crucial historical questions. Uh, and I'll give two examples. Um, a question that has occupied economic historians in recent, recent decades is the question of what is called the European miracle. Why did economic growth occur in the West and not elsewhere in the world? There's an enormous literature devoted to this nowadays, enormous literature. Um, and in one of his essays, oh, it's almost a throwaway line, one of his essays, not even one of the books, Mises identifies the underlying reason for the growth of uh, development of uh, uh, um, economic welfare in the West compared to the rest of the world. He says, the idea of liberty is and always has been peculiar to the West. The East lacked the primordial thing, the idea of freedom from the state. It never called into question the arbitrariness of the despots, and that the East he means uh, from the Middle East uh, all the way to the Far East. And first of all, it never established the legal framework that would protect the private citizen's wealth against confiscation on the part of tyrants. Now, uh, as I say, there are many uh, economic historians who have um, developed this um, economic, uh, this European miracle idea. Um, Rosenblatt and Birdsell, and how the West grew rich. Um, Douglas North won a Nobel Prize mainly for his work in economic history of, of this kind, and, um, and many others. And again and again, they point out there are different uh, uh, causes. Uh, Europe had favorable geographical um, uh, position in many ways. However, the root cause and the root difference between Europe and other civilizations was the limitation of the predatory uh, taxation and, and uh, confiscation policy of governments. The sort of thing that was uh, in the Ottoman Empire, in Persia, in India, in China also, uh, for instance, through long periods, uh, that was standard. The right of, or in ancient times, in ancient Egypt, uh, the uh, right of the ruler to uh, uh, take uh, private property at will. There were reasons why um, uh, Europe um, uh, was different, having to do with the feudal system, having to do with the international church, and, uh, and uh, other, other things. But the fact is that this is what eventuated in Europe. Limitations on the uh, predatory taxing and uh, confiscating power of the state. And what I'm saying is that there is this vast literature, and it's very uh, interesting and uh, very elaborate, but Mises got to the heart of the matter in just a few sentences. Or take the question of the Industrial Revolution. As Hayek wrote, the myth of the immiseration of the working class in the Industrial Revolution is a supreme historical myth of socialism. Hayek edited a little book called um, Capitalism and the Historians, 
which is uh, still in print uh, after, I don't know, 50 years or something, um, University of Chicago Press. And there are a number of good essays there, and Hayek has this essay on, um, on the, uh, the historians and capitalism, on, on uh, history and, uh, and politics. And, um, and he says that uh, this, see, people, you'd think that people would get their uh, political opinions from philosophy, maybe, or from economics, certainly. But what seems to be the case is that they mainly get it from history, filtered down from philosophy and, and economics. But historians then deal with uh, different periods of, of, um, of history, and um, they typically approach it in an anti-capitalist uh, way. You consider your own um, background in history. Uh, we had a period uh, uh, that was the, uh, called the age of the robber barons, didn't we? Uh, when you had unfettered capitalism and it went wild and crazy and they stole everything from everybody. And, um, and but thankfully the progressive uh, uh, movement and progressive presidents came in and uh, there's a, a statue of uh, uh, the Federal Trade Commission in Washington. Do you, have you ever seen that? It's a kind of um, um, uh, uh, high relief of uh, a man taming a wild horse or a big uh, fierce horse. Why is it the Federal, Federal Trade Commission? Because that's government regulation um, taming unfettered capitalism. And um, so that's, uh, that, that's part of the interpretation of American history. And then somehow uh, again we had unfettered capitalism in the 1920s and it brought about the Great Depression. Okay, And thankfully um, I mean, there's a God that looks over the fate of the United States of America. Uh, we got Franklin Roosevelt, okay? <laughs> and uh, and uh, the Great Depression was cured, and capitalism was fettered again. So what my point is that this is a basic uh, uh, view that, uh, that people have of American history. And that, more than anything else, really, colors their view, uh, their approach to uh, political questions. Now... And Hayek is saying that the greatest of all of, all of these was this myth of the Industrial Revolution and how, uh, because of uh, unfettered capitalism, uh, the uh, working class was uh, practically enslaved and uh, reduced to terrible conditions. I don't think that I could work that. That looks complicated. So let me give you some uh, figures, okay? Uh, this is the population of England in 1750. Population of England and Wales was six million. It had never been more than six million in all the history since the time of the ancient Britons. By 1800, the population was 12 million. By 1850, the population was 24 million. Okay? By 1900, it was 42 million. And Mises points this out in the similar uh, population figures for most of the West, not France, but for most other countries. The question is, well, first of all, why did this come about? Well, demographers are not sure. There uh, could be uh, various reasons. Um, but uh, certainly one of the consequences was that people had to face the problem. How are these new tens of millions of people going to live? Um, and Mises says the solution was the Industrial Revolution. Um, the solution was the factory system, the industrialization of the West that uh, created uh, jobs for all these tens of millions of people. Okay, and then, of course, there was a tremendous uh, downward pressure on, uh, on wages, but they didn't go down as much as they might have, uh, and sometimes didn't really go down at all. Simply, um, there wasn't an increase in during certain uh, years in, uh, in wages. But the end result was that then people were in the, were the working class was in a position to uh, begin enjoying things by the end of the 19th century. Western workers in, in all countries, let's say England for instance, uh, were better off than workers had ever been in history. Uh, they could uh, eat and drink uh, at, at will. Famines were a thing of the past, although they had existed just a few decades before in England and in other countries. Uh, you know, they had uh, insurance policies, they owned their own homes sometimes, owned their own furniture, 
savings accounts. And what, is, what, what does this uh, do to? Um, well, the history books will tell you it's due to the unions. Somehow the unions came in, which were a minute part of the labor force in any Western country except Germany. Uh, but uh, uh, England, which didn't have the high, highest economic growth for working class people. But they were a minute part of the working, of the working class in England, certainly in the United States. Um, or again, uh, a benevolent government came in and somehow raised uh, living standards. But that doesn't stand up to elementary economic uh, analysis. That's not how uh, wages, real wages, are increased by, for a whole class, for, by, uh, for tens of millions of people. Um, and um, the famous economic historian T.S. Ashton said, if you, want to, if you want to see a country that has experienced a population explosion of the kind that England did, but no industrial revolution, go to Calcutta. Uh, or you could say, uh, just go across the channel to Ireland. Right? Ireland didn't have any of these terrible, dark, satanic mills. Right? The fouling uh, uh, God's green earth where you, where you might have thought that Jesus walked in the Blake poem, uh, and uh, when the uh, potato crop failed, the people um, starved or emigrated. I'm not saying that the Irish shouldn't have come to America. That's a whole different question. We don't have to get into that. <laughs> but um, but my, my point is, it's here, you know, people uh, spend so much time talking about this, and here Mises pinpointed what was involved. The Industrial Revolution took place against the background of an unprecedented population explosion, which explains why it was a, uh, um, it was a, a, a benign thing. You don't have to go as, to, as far as uh, Ayn did. She was, after all, a novelist and poetic person. Says that, we, that the pe working people should get down and worship these smokestacks. Uh, but what she was saying, essentially, was was true that it was a solution for the uh, survival or question of working people. Now, I want to, let me just say something a moment, since I mentioned Milton Friedman before, and we're talking about uh, Mises' um, character. I want to say something about Mises' uh, fabled intolerance. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for Milton Friedman. I was at the London meeting of the Montpellier Society a few years ago when I think they just did, invaded uh, uh, Iraq for the first time under George, the first George Bush. And um, not uh, apropos of this uh, in particular, but they had messages uh, or in some cases in person appearances from their uh, stable of center-right uh, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, Gary Becker, uh, Coase, and uh, I guess some others, and, and a recorded statement from Friedman, who made it a point to warn against the um, erosion of civil liberties in any wartime situation. Um, these others, um, uh, you know, they couldn't be concerned about anything but the uh, reducing the capital gains tax, which is an important point, but... Um, uh, question of war and peace is at least on the, on the same level. But Friedman is concer was concerned about that. He warned against the uh, rush to war. So as I say, I have a good deal of respect for him, but he has gone on record as saying um, some very foolish and indefensible things about Mises in, in, in um, connection with Mises' methodology. Um, Mises' intolerance uh, allegedly, um, was due to his methodo methodological doctrine of praxeology. Friedman says, his fundamental idea was that we knew things about human action, the title of his famous book, because we are human beings. As a result, he argued, we have absolutely certain knowledge of the motivations of human actions, no, that's not what Mises said at all, the motivations of human actions. And he maintained that we can derive substantive conclusions from that basic knowledge. Facts, statistical or other evidence, cannot, he argued, 
be used to text, test these conclusions. That philosophy converts an asserted body of substantive conclusions into a religion. And he's not using religion in a favorable sense. Friedman uh, uh, posits this. Supposing two people, Friedman says, who share from Mises' praxeological view, come to contradictory conclusions about anything. How can they reconcile their difference? The only way they, they can do so is by a purely logical argument. One has to say to the other, you made a mistake in reasoning. And the other has to say, no, you made a mistake in reasoning. Supposing neither believes he has made a mistake in reasoning. The only thing left to do is fight. I don't know what to... Now, Mises, uh, I mean, Friedman said this in some popular uh, uh, article in some libertarian journal, but I'm, I'm afraid that he has also repeated this in public. I was at a, um, on a panel uh, with him years ago at Stanford uh, on the welfare state, where for some reason these kids uh, from Stanford had never heard of Mises. Um, uh, Friedman launches into an attack on, on Mises' intolerance on this basis. So I don't think it's uh, unfair to, to, uh, to hold him to it. So, the pro this is one of the problems. Friedman's theory would predict the occurrence of incessant bloody brawling among ma mathematicians and logicians, right? Since they uh, maybe don't agree and they would don't have to fight, but the non-occurrence of which falsifies the theory in Friedman's own positivist terms. Friedman's position ent also entails that no religious person who felt certain about his religious beliefs could have any principled reason to respect the conflicting religious beliefs of others, which is absurd, which um, the uh, talk by my friend Lawrence Vance uh, should convince you of. Finally, Friedman's explanation of Mises' alle alleged personal uh, intolerance, even if we want to accept that as a fact, fails to account for the personal tolerance of other practitioners of the a priori method. So that's a um, un un really unfortunate uh, episode in uh, Friedman's career, as far as I'm concerned. A much more veridical view of Mises' character, uh, you can find uh, on um, the uh, Mises.org um, um, website and their archives. It's a, um, an article from the uh, Free Market from um, July 2004 by Lou, by Lou Rockwell, called Heart of a Fighter. And that gives you, I think, a much be a better idea of uh, Mises' um, character than, uh, than uh, you'll gather from, uh, from Friedman. Now, Mises went through a, a, a certain personal crisis because of... Um, and in his, uh, uh, not the personal in the sense of anything to do with his personal life, but in, in his uh, mind, uh, because of the world situation and, uh, and uh, how it conflicted with his own vision. And also he, he thought out uh, how it has to in the modern world, not just happens to, but how it has to. Now, he's, uh, what is the role of economics? Well, he says, the people must eventually decide. We have democracy, no way around that. It is true economists have the duty to inform their fellow men. But what happens if these economists do not measure up to the di dialectic task and are pushed aside by demagogues? Or if the masses lack the intelligence to understand the teachings of the economists? Is the attempt to guide the people on the right road not hopeless? Especially when we recognize that men like John Maynard Keynes, Bertrand Russell, Harold Lasky, and Albert Einstein could not comprehend economic problems. I like that typical Misesian touch of Keynes not being able to <laughs> comprehend. But uh, he does mention Einstein. I remember reading a, a pamphlet by Einstein years ago. It was just a pamphlet in, entitled Why Socialism? And uh, Einstein said the basic reason for socialism is that Socialism puts profits ahead of people. As so Mises says, you know, if, if Einstein can't get any deeper than that, what can you expect from the masses of people? <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
This is an expression of the despair that assailed Mises at the time of the First World War. By what conceivable means could the masses in democratic societies be won for the principles of private property and the free market? This is a problem as uh, the world entered the uh, age of democracy from the middle of the uh, 19th century on uh, that claimed the attention of liberals, uh, in fact earlier from the time of the French ideologues at the beginning of the century. Um, Richard Cobden, who was a great uh, English liberal, the German liberal leader Eugen Richter, were among those who followed these French writers, the ideologues, in proposing to use the public education system to instill the principles of sound economics in the masses. Right? I mean, that certainly worked out that way. <laughs> <coughs> More generally, it was supposed to be the task of all true liberals to foster public enlightenment in order to forestall popular acceptance of disastrous economic and social policies. I mean, if the majority were, uh, were in control of the government, what would prevent them simply from confiscating the wealth of anybody richer than they were? Thinking that, uh, you know, so what? Uh, so what? If they followed that principle of... Ex of uh, um, confiscating the wealth of uh, any uh, reasonably affluent person, uh, we would still be living in grass huts, as uh, Camille uh, Paglia said about something else. Um, you can't have civilization without private property. You can't have civilization on the basis of confiscating the wealth of anybody who stands a little uh, above the average. Mises considered the, this problem about um, using public enlightenment. Uh, but, he says, we are badly deceived to believe that more schools and lectures, popularization of books and journals, could produce the uh, uh, right doctrine. In fact, false doctrines can re um, recruit their followers in the same way. The evil consists precisely in the people's intellectual disqualification to choose the means that lead to the desired objectives. The fact that this is what I think Brian Kaplan deals with in his book, uh, the uh, myth of the uh, uh, the myth of the uh, uh, uninformed voter. Um, the fact that facile uh, decisions can be foisted upon the people demonstrates that they are incapable of independent judgment. This is precisely the great danger. And he said, Mises says, I thus arrived at this hopeless pessimism that for a long time had burdened the best minds of Europe. Uh, Mises means by this the, the best minds, Jakob Burkhardt, Nicole Menger, Max Weber. But what is enlightening and exemplary is how Mises dealt with this pessimistic conclusion. There's a good deal of Albert J. Knox Isaiah in his response. Uh, it must be on the uh, fee website. It's a great essay by Albert J. Nock, Isaiah's job. Isaiah's job was to, to f not to convert the whole world, but to find and inform the remnant. Mises says, it is a matter of temperament how we shape our lives in the knowledge of an inescapable catastrophe. He mentions that when in high school he chose a, ver a verse of Virgil as a personal motto. You can see it all over the Institute. Do not yield to the bad, but always oppose it with courage. It's not clear uh, psychologically what led uh, Mises to this uh, change of, of mind, uh, to the, uh, turned him towards a great positive work that, uh, to which he devoted the rest of his long life. He said, again and again I face situations from which Rational deliberations could find no escape. But then something unexpected occurred that brought deliverance. What seems to have happened that Mises is that Mises became possessed of an interior courage and led him recklessly and against all odds to fight for the good cause as he saw it. He said, I made, I made heavy personal sacrifices Although I always foresaw that, foresaw that success would be denied me. 
But I do not regret that I attempted the impossible. I could not act otherwise. I fought because I could do no other. An obvious uh, self-conscious deliberate echo of Martin Luther's, here I stand, I can do no other. The outcome of this powerful inner resolution is uh, described by Mises. I would not tire in professing what I knew to be right, and so I decided to write a book on socialism, which I had contemplated before the war. I now set about ex executing my plan, and the result was his book, Socialism. Um, it is a landmark in 20th century social science. It's a landmark in uh, history of thought. Um, you can find this book in um, a nice uh, Liberty Press edition with a new essay by, by Hayek. And uh, the book found its remnant. Hayek uh, explained in his introduction. When socialism first appeared in 1922, its impact was profound. It gradually but fundamentally altered the outlook of many of the young idealists returning to their university studies after World War I. A number of my contemporaries, who later became well known, uh, but who were uh, then unknown to each other, went through the same experience. Wilhelm Röpke in Germany, um, Lionel Robbins in England, and Hayek himself. They had been uh, fuzzy-minded socialists, although it's hard uh, to imagine Hayek as a fuzzy-minded socialist, but nonetheless that was their uh, inclination and Mises turned them around. And the message was passed on through the famous Mises seminar, or well, the first one in Vienna. Participants over the years uh, included not only Hayek, but Gottfried Habler, Fritz Machlup, Oscar Morgenstern, Eric Fergelin, and others who went on to uh, achieve uh, fame Now, uh, I, don't, I don't want to give the, nobody is infallible, and I don't want to give the impression that, the, that Mises was invariably correct. <coughs> I think Mises was incorrect, unfortunately, um, importantly incorrect, when um, uh, he defended uh, British imperialism in the 19th century because it uh, promoted free trade, for instance, in the opium wars with China. Uh, so he says that that's not even imperialism. If you, if you wage war in order to open up a market, that's not even imperialism. Uh, well, I don't know. The United States was a uh, protectionist country, the later part of the 19th century. And would England have been um, uh, justified in attacking the United States to open up the American market? Or was it just a question of the fact that the United States was too strong and China was weak? And that uh, allowed for uh, free trade imperialism. Um, the root of Mises' problem, I think, is his conception, antiseptic, uh, immaculate conception of the state. For him, the state is simply the apparatus of compulsion and coercion. He contemptu contemptuously rejects Nietzsche's dictum, the state is the coldest of all cold monsters. Finally, something Mises said, uh, Nietzsche says it's sensible. <laughs> um, Mises says the state is neither cold nor warm. All human activity is human activity, and its goal is the preservation. All state activity is human activity, not monsters, and its goal is the preservation of society. But what if this uh, state apparatus has a dynamism of its own? Uh, for instance, what if mi mi imperialism and the military and civilian bureaucracies it brings into being lead to state activism uh, beyond merely assuring free trade? I see that uh, uh, Joseph Schumpeter's book, uh, his two essays on imperialism and social classes, are available outside. And uh, Schumpeter wrote on the evolution of imperialism created by wars that required it, the machine now created the wars it required. 
which I think is a very profound statement and bears thinking about military apparatuses. Yet none of this uh, appears to enter uh, into Mises' economic calculations, nor, to take British imperialism as an example, uh, does um, he consider the effect of British imperialism as a model and spur to expansionist strivings of other nations, above all Germany, with all the baleful consequences that followed it. So Mises was not uh, perfect, in, in my view anyway, but uh, there's no, uh, I, I hope I've given an idea that there's no getting away from his greatness. Mises is what uh, could be called a culture hero. Now a culture hero is um, um, somebody uh, who has great achievements to his credit, but also a great and heroic character. Uh, a, a fighting character often. A Galileo is considered, a, in that sense, a culture hero. Uh, or, or Beethoven, who uh, fought against the restrictions on music of his time. But uh, Mises, I, uh, I would say, is such a culture hero. Is a culture hero for me. I've known a great many uh, very smart people in my time. It's one of the best things that's happened to me. Uh, Murray, of course, Ein. Uh, Milton Friedman, Hayek, uh, Bob Nozick, and so on. But to my mind, no one had ever made this kind of impression that uh, Ludwig von Mises did. Now, what I've done is give you the briefest kind of introduction for a mere 40 bucks or so. Right, Lou? you will soon have available a work of magnificent, um, real grandeur of intellectual history, The Life and Times of uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, by uh, Professor Guido Hiltzmann. This is the definitive work on von Mises. Um, you can f uh, it's easy enough to find out on the Mises website all the effort Guido put in, he went into he went to, to Vienna, he went to Moscow, he went to Grove City. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> to gather uh, the documents and so on. And um, it's a huge work also. Uh, I had the, um, uh, I was happy to, to be able to read it in an early draft. And now it's finally going to come out. Uh, it'll be out probably in a few weeks. However, uh, if you do what you're supposed to do and come to the 25th uh, anniversary meeting of the Ludwig von Mises Institute in New York in October, uh, then uh, uh, you'll, have, uh, you'll have the privilege of having Guido, you can buy the book there and you have the privilege of having Guido sign it for you. Uh, you, you find out about uh, this uh, meeting, it's really going to be fine, it's going to be great. And, uh, the Schlarbaum uh, Award, of which I was the second recipient after Otto von Habsburg, the natural progression, Habsburg, Reiko. Um, it'll be given to Bob Higgs. If you followed his work and so on, this guy is becoming a radical. This guy is, makes uh, Bob Murphy uh, look like a neocon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, it, and it'll be New York at the Grand Hyatt on 42nd. There's going to be, Pat Barnett is a, a, arranging for a bus tour of the places in Manhattan that were important in the lives of, uh, of Mises and of Murray, uh, including a trip up to Columbia University where Murray's um, research library was, uh, was located. And altogether, it's going to be a, a very enjoyable time. Uh, well, thanks very much. And... <laughs> nope, nope.